Welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining our second uh, Thought Cultures in Everyday Objects seminar series. Uh, today our theme is geographies and as with the first meeting last week, we're on two parts uh, this afternoon uh, in the UK and then there's a slightly briefer session at seven o'clock UK time. Uh, my name is Claire Omani. I welcome you on behalf of our DHS ambassador, Victoria Girasta, who will be doing all of the wonderful introductions of our impressive panel of speakers uh, throughout our conversation this afternoon. But it's my great pleasure just to signal the, the goal of these conversations. We began our virtual seminar series under the constraints of the pandemic, whilst I was chair of the Design History Society. But we found this was a wonderful opportunity to engage with a very much wider global audience of speakers and participants. So it's something that we decided to sustain throughout my tenure. Um, I've stepped down now as Sally Ann Huxtable has taken over as chair, but I promised that having worked with uh, Victoria designing the call for papers for this and <coughs> process, that we wanted to be sure that um, I had a chance to, to partner her through this opportunity. As I say, the ambassador role is one of a whole set of different ways in which one can join in the Design History Society. One is always keen to have people want to participate as conference paper givers, conference hosts. Uh, we have a whole uh, portfolio of grant applications. We very much wish to support uh, this kind of interaction in your institution anywhere in the world. We have grants to subsidize these kinds of symposia, uh, but also obviously we very much welcome submissions to the Journal of Design History as well. So thank you for joining us today. And as I say, this is a topic that came out of the ambassador program. Each ambassador is invited to propose a theme and then they work with the chair of the society, developing that into a call for papers, and we were blessed with an enormously rich and impressive set of proposals. So the conversation today, we've clustered around the theme of geographies. Last week, we were looking at temporalities. Next week, we'll think about ideas of place making. But what we wanted to uh, explore here, in a way, was both the very complex and contested relationship with ideas of nation, as well as the transnational exchanges that are at the heart of a lot of folk cultures. And we were delighted to have a set of proposals that think about the complexities of borderlands, of occupation, of dialogue and debate about what constitutes the idea of folk identity and its manifestation in material form. So it's my great pleasure to hand over to Victoria, who will be your host, uh, introducing all of our impressive speakers today. Thank you, Clay, for your introduction, and I want to welcome everyone to the um, second day of the Folk Cultures and Everyday Object series. I just want to mention that at the very end of the presentations, there will be a Q&A. So if you've got any questions or comments, just put them in the chat box and we'll read them at the very end. So our first speaker today is Dr. Piotr Corduba, um, Professor, Art Historian, Director of Art History Institute at the Adam Mickiewicz University in Poznań in Poland, specialist in the field of the living architecture, culture of housing and interior design, urban issues and also German-Polish art and cultural relationships. He has published six books and many articles, and his last book was dedicated to the folk-oriented aesthetics in Polish design and interior decorations in 20th century in view of their ideological context titled Folklore for Sale. Now he is conducting the research project Furniture Making in Post 1945 to 1989, Education, Design and Production. So over to you, Piotr. Thank you. Uh -huh. Thank you, thank you so much, uh, Victoria, for your kind introduction. And first of all, thank you very much for the invitation to the uh, to the conference. Um, so I decided to prepare a short story about two uh, cities uh, in contemporary Poland. Please, the next uh, um, uh, dia, please. Mm. 
And, um, oh, perfect, thank you, so I'm them up. Um, about two uh, places, two cities. Uh, the first one is Bolesławiec uh, in German Bunslau and Opole in German uh, Opel, uh, which is which are pretty famous uh, in both sides of the of the border, uh, having a wonderful and very interesting um, design history, which is linked or which is associated uh, with uh, uh, folklore, folk art, folk art oriented uh, uh, design, and so on. So my goal tonight, to, to, to this afternoon, is uh, uh, to talk you to explain you how it happened. So let's start with uh, geography, which is definitely not uh, obvious for uh, everyone. Uh, both cities are today on Polish territory in a south uh, western part, but before forty-five, uh, they belonged to Germany. Both belong actually to the uh, um, to the spe spe specific historical land, uh, which is called uh, Silesia, and which used to be and still is um, regionally diverse. I mean, culturally, uh, socially, um, ethnographic is also completely different and has always been a borderland. So uh, shortening the complicated uh, history of this territory, it should be said that this land uh, were um, connected with Poland um, uh, many centuries ago, particularly in the Middle Ages, then belonged to Prussia, to, to, uh, uh, at the very beginning to the Habsburg Empire, then to Prussia and uh, from, the, uh, from the 18th century, and then Germany, and so on until 1945. So it was uh, it was a, a area. It was a territory of uh, very intensive tensions between uh, German and uh, Poland. And German Polish disputes over these lands were a permanent part of our common history, not only politically but also culturally. So after the uh, uh, Second World War, um, uh, this part was added to uh, to Poland and. Um, uh, um, uh, uh, was called as a recovered territories. Although the term um, is bound with the propaganda um, dimension of political success after the Second World War, but the annexion of these territories to Poland required a great deal of integration, the creation of new identity, and um, uh, uh, and for this for these places, and actually just simple their Polonization. The recovery territory is also perceived as a highly civilized uh, with rich manufacturing facilities, uh, like in Bolesławie, it's pottery factories, but culture foreign. Um, Bolesławie was decidedly um, a German town until um, 1945, but in case of Opole, the situation was, was uh, more complex and its region uh, uh, used to have a Polish uh, uh, majority. Today, Opole Silesia, this region, uh, on the other hand, is inhabited by a German minority, and the region itself manifests many distinctions from both the rest of Silesia and the country as a whole. So, so much uh, geography. But as I, as, as I said, uh, the new Polish borders after the Second World War, um, the displacement of uh, uh, people uh, from the former eastern part of uh, uh, pre-war Poland, now Western Ukraine, uh, Belarus of Lithuania, resulted in need uh, for cultural and social integration. And at this point, we must uh, talk, we must mention very famous company, which called Cepelia, please the next slide. And its uh, uh, its role, uh, the, the the whole uh, title, uh, um, the the whole name of its, uh, company is Folk and Artistic Industry Headquarters. This state institution, established in 1949, had, to make the long story short, three important goals: to spread care um, of folk arts and crafts, to organize folk and artistic production, and to sell these projects production products. The idea for this institution has already been established in uh, pre-war Poland and, in and its structure, so I mean production and trade, was built also then. In communist uh, uh, Poland, it was particularly emphasized for its importance in promoting folk and handicrafts uh, as the basis of national culture. In practice, it's all, it also served to take over formerly private and like in case in uh, um, uh, Bolesławiec, 
post-German German production facilities, mainly artistic. The issue, um, so one of the Cepelia's tasks was the cultural and artistic assimilation of recovered territories. And this issue was hotly debated at, at board meetings, uh, both with, by management and uh, experts, ethnographers and art historians. The state authorities accused uh, Cepelia of having developed um, its network of stores well, for example, in a Silesia city, but having still problem to set up a production cooperative uh, to product, I'm quoting, folk art and handicraft. So Cepelia has taken to work. And I hope we are now be better prepared for uh, to, to, to look deeper and closer to at Bolesławiec and Opole. First of all, Bolesławiec. In the photography, you see uh, almost identical, at least in terms of shape of uh, decoration um, dishes. Meanwhile, um, they were created at, uh, at a different time with different motivations and addressed to different uh, audiences. What you need them, it's a place, Bolesławiec, of creation and decorative motifs. On the left, uh, we have a coffee um, service made at it's one of several German um, ceramics factories that operated until 45. In this case, it's a, a Paul and Son uh, uh, factory. And the very characteristic uh, oval pattern uh, is called stem decoration and was made with sponge, uh, later um, rubber stamps, and covered by underglaze paints um, in cobalt green and, uh, and brown. It was one of many designs and patterns of this and other Bolesławic factory, Bolesławic factories, which in the first half of the 20th century uh, reflected probably all aesthetic trends like Art Nouveau, Art Deco, and also this folk art, art oriented um, tendencies trends. We know very precisely that this decoration was uh, um, invented in nearby Bolesławiec uh, and in this region in 1882, anonymous. And this stamp decoration uh, uh, was very popular uh, uh, um, at the production uh, from the beginning of the 20th century till 45, for obvious reason, mainly in the German areas. After 45, the Polish authorities intended to make use of Bolesławiec uh, production facilities, even though the factories was, were partly destroyed and their equipment stolen. The former Paul and Son factory was taken over by aforementioned Cepelia company in uh, 1950. And Cepelia began producing ceramics with the help, with the help of ceramic artists, graduates mainly uh, of the Academy of Fine Arts in Breslau, uh, so Wrocław, previous Breslau. Cepelia produced here in Bolesławie. It's a lot of excellent modern artistic uh, ceramics, but at the same time, tried to fulfilling the, its mission to care for and promote folk art. It initiated a production line inspired by local pottery and Silesian folk art, I'm quoting. So the stamp decoration invented, invented in the region 70 years ago and realized by private, commercial, German uh, production factories was chosen as the highlight of this production. Although Cepelia exhibitions or catalogs accurately described um, this motif as a regional uh, folk one, it was never explained uh, which tradition and which you know, country uh, folk were meant. During the communist era, there was also no mention of the German past of the factory itself and of the production before 45. The tradition of ceramic production in Bolesławiec, which was taken up um, by the Cepelia after Second World War, is one of the few besides Opole, which has survived the political transformation around 1989 and still functions perfectly, which is not a, 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 a typical situation in Poland and not a typical uh, a, a future of the Cepelia um, heritage. Their icon, I'm talking about the Bolesławiec, is precisely the stamp decoration uh, functioning today in a very many variants. 
In all major Polish cities, there are company stores of ceramic of, uh, from Bolesławiec. As early as, 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 in the 97, as in the 70s, a significant percentage of uh, production was exported to Germany. And in Germany, it's easy to meet agent uh, selling Bundslauer ceramic in Germany, uh, manufactured in Polish Bolesławiec. Uh, in Germany, it's also the um, uh, online sales uh, well developed uh, under the page uh, Bundslau Scheune. Scheune is uh, burn. So uh, even in the with the name is this whole rural atmosphere aura uh, uh, um, used as a marketing strategy uh, in a German site. Let's have another another uh, uh, slide and look at Opole. The emergence of a new local tradition uh, uh, looked different in Opole. Uh, there were no production uh, facilities, uh, but there was a lively custom of decorating uh, X for Eastern uh, called Kroshanka, uh, white spring uh, among the mixed rural population. Uh, the X were decorating using uh, the scratch technique. Um, and to keep this tradition uh, alive, the regional museum from Opole organized scratched egg competitions uh, starting in the 50s. Um, during the one of these competitions, uh, particular um, in 1963, was made an attempt uh, to transfer this technique to porcelain. Uh, actually, at the beginning, to porcelain, uh, less quality porcelain, but the uh, ethnographers said no, uh, uh, should be uh, China. At that point, uh, the regional Cepelia mentioned, took the initiative, coordinating experiments to transfer the technique and motifs to porcelain uh, to China dishes. It must be said that these such China dishes were never manufactured in Opole. Cepelia from Opole acquired them from the production of Silesian porcelain factories, mostly for former German ones, and from one of the historic uh, Polish China factory in Śmierów. So folk artists, worked in Opole only on its decoration. The dishes were fired again on site. And the lack of the technological tradition and the use of technology from Eastern eggs uh, acquired obviously many technological experimentations and, and obstacles. In the photo on the right side, uh, we see a cup uh, still made in the scratch technique. But this technique provides to, uh, to be impermanent on, uh, on, port on porcelain, on China, and already in the transport of the dishes, there are losses in the, in the paints. So it was decided to improve uh, um, the technology at the same time to introduce a actually fundamental innovation, not to scratch, but to paint porcelain. Please, the next one. This change uh, uh, also led to radical revolution in traditional design, expanding the color palette and eventually enriching the motifs. It's not worthy that the decoration was put on the contemporary in shape dishes, primarily utilitarian like uh, 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 coffee, tea or dinner services. So the shape was not folk oriented or retro or, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, in, style, in this style. It's interesting to note also that the porcelain as a material, it's my opinion, disappeared under this uh, very rich painted flowers and the dishes uh, became similar to more folk ceramic ones. As in the case of uh, ceramic Boles from Boleslavic, porcelain from uh, Opole was exported from the 70s mainly to Germany. In exhibitions and catalogs, the folk origins, origins of the motifs the involvement of uh, folk patterns, uh, painters and patterns in the decoration of a porcelain were clearly uh, exposed. As in the case in Boleswabiec, however, the ethnographic specificity of the region uh, was not explained, nor was Cepelia's mission in inventing and promoting local tradition. Cepelia remained as a neutral animator of folk manufacturing. So production in Opole also survived uh, the political transformation uh, in the nineties, and it's perhaps less familiar to the German clients uh, than the Boleswabiec, but it's still purchased locally, but, but uh, by visitors from Germany uh, visiting the former uh, German land, but also by a Pol uh, clients from uh, Poland. 
As in Ebola Suavis, we can observe the uh, emergence of successive variants of this flora decolation, as well as its further transfer to souvenirs, to uh, paper products, uh, even clothing uh, accessories. It even appears in the furnishing of restaurants and local uh, hotels on walls, tablecloths, so simply uh, become an element of local visual identity. Uh, the time is over, so there are two stories uh, how um, invented, um, reinvented, or even constructed uh, tradition become common to both nations and have still a uh, future um, in progress and uh, uh, in their develop developed. Thank you very much for your uh, attention. Thank you so much, Piotr. That was a very great presentation, especially because I recognize some of the things you were talking about. Um, so I next speak. Also, if you've got any questions, you can just pop them in the chat and we'll get to them at the very end. Um, I next speak today is Elina Ku. Um, she is a PhD candidate in history of art and design at the University of Brighton. Her PhD dissertation is a comparative study of ethnic dolls from 19th and 20th century. East Asia. Previously, she worked as curatorial assistant for Korean art at the Asian Art Museum of San Francisco. Ku completed an MA in History of Art and Archaeology of East Asia at SOAS, University of London, and a BS in Art History at the Fashion Institute of Technology, State University of New York. So over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Victoria, for your kind introduction. And first of all, I'm truly honored to be part of the DHS seminar series, Folk Cultures in Everyday Objects. And today I will talk about images and narratives in Joseon folk dolls made during the Japanese colonial period from 1910 to 1945. Can you go to the next slide, please? Joseon folk doll or Joseon Pungsuk Inhyang in Korean is a type of product that was popularly sold as souvenirs to foreign customers who visited Korea in the early to mid 20th century. For those who may not be familiar with the history of Korea, Joseon is the previous name for the country. As the name of the product indicates, Joseon folk dolls display the daily lives of the people of Korea. Although the precise history of how Joseon folk dolls were invented or developed um, needs further study, it can be assumed that the colonial regime brought the wide production of Joseon folk dolls in the Korean peninsula, as these specific type of dolls had not been produced in Korea before the colonial period. And these dolls you see on the screen now were made with various Japanese doll making techniques. For example, the wooden doll on the far left is made with Ichi Itobori technique, and next to it, there is a doll that looks similar to Japan's Ichimatsu doll. The flat door in the middle is made using Oshie technique from Japan, and the paper doll resembles um, compar comparable examples made in Japan with European um, influences during the late 19th and early 20th century. The clay door on the far right displays a similar technique used in Fushimi doll in Japan. Um, these serve as poignant examples of a hybrid, hybrid form of colonial material culture in which what was asso associated with the colonial subjects was combined with visual culture of the colonizer. The term Joseon folk doll was also derived from the Japanese term Fusoku Ningyo. Um, there are many different types of Joseon folk dolls, as you see. Um, but across various mediums, there are certain images that repeatedly appear in almost every type of Joseon folk doll. And I'll discuss some examples in the next few slides. Next slide, please. One of the most popularly portrayed images in Joseon folk dolls was a woman carrying a water jar on her head. Historically, it is a common scene in Korea where working class women carry a water jar to get water from a well or a river stream. Such a scene was considered folklore, quote unquote, and described and illustrated by foreign ethnographers and anthropologists, including Japanese. 
it was often mentioned that Korean women needed to be freed from such labor with the development of the proper water system. Despite their laborious imageries, the figures are lightly smiling with the costumes brightly colored for decorative purposes, although Korean peasant women mostly wore white only garments at the time. Next slide, please. Another image that was depicted in various types of Joseon folk dolls was a woman carrying a baby on the back. Similar to the image of a, water, a woman with a water jar, this kind of imagery was extensively photographed, illustrated, and written about by foreign visitors during the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Although some of these dolls were later labeled as mother and child figures, the depicted woman not, might not be the mothers of the babies. When looking at the clay doll, which is the first from the left, the baby is chubby, has light skin, and wears a colorful multi-striped garment, whereas the woman is lean, um, has tanned skin, and wears a garment revealing her breast. This suggests that she is probably the nanny of the um, baby. Um, it is worth considering that not many women of privileged backgrounds were allowed to be seen in the public sphere in the traditional system of Korea. Therefore, those who were visualized um, through dolls tended to be um, peasant women who had to work and be active outside. Next slide, please. Um, the last example I would like to discuss today is a man carrying an A-frame carrier called Chige in Korean. Um, notably portrayed in many existing Joseon folk dolls um, and other visual materials, including postcards and photographs, such a figure is emphasized with the carrier stacked with items such as pottery and firewood. The main male figures tend to be aged with their backs slightly bent to endure the weight of the carried items, often supported by a wooden stack. Unlike the female figures, these dolls are less decorated with colors and the facial expressions are less vibrant. Next slide, please. Um, although there exists a, a more variety of examples of Joseon folk doll designs, including those depicting um, elite class men and women, as well as children figures of various classes, um, the examples I discussed today were the most common imageries portrayed in a set of Joseon folk dolls packaged in a box and brought to foreign countries. These images and narratives found in Joseon folk dolls reinforce the hierarchies of classes, gender roles, and quote unquote cultural differences. The visual references could be traced to ethnographic research materials and photographs used and taken by others, um, quote unquote, as you can see on the screen. Um, it is also noting, uh, worth noting that the image of a woman with a water jar carrying a baby on the back is the main image um, depicted on the postcard box, which, is, which was another popular souvenir item. Um, the process of representing the people of Korea and entitling those as Joseon folk dolls is deeply political and interdisciplinary. By putting together the term Joseon, the name of the bygone dynasty taken over by the Japanese empire with the term folk doll, it perpetuates the static images of the people of Korea and delineates the country's temporal and geographical boundaries. The making of Joseon folk dolls indicates the evolving and expansive discourse on folk culture, quote unquote, um, in both academic and creative fields. Um, this leads to a series of questions on um, what is considered folk, who defines it, who are the performers, and who are the stakeholders. I leave these questions to um, you all, but I would like to encourage you to think about the invention of folk cultures as Eric Hosbaum um, insisted on the invention of tradition. Um, the attempts to define, visualize, and objectify quote unquote folk cultures have been, has been, have been persistently carried out and need to be understood in, light in line with um, deliberate interventions of external forces, which are often disguised and removed. Okay. 
Thank you for your attention. Yeah, that's the end of my presentation. Thank you so much. That was very interesting. Wow. Um, so if you've got any questions, just leave them in the comment box and then we'll read them after all of the presentations. Um, so my first speaker today is Carlos Bartolo, who is a graphic design graduate with a master's degree in equipment design and a PhD in design, teaching at Luciada University in Lisbon since 1995. Since his MA, he centers his studies um, in the Portuguese design history field, researching the design object as an ideological communication support, especially in extreme political spheres. His PhD research reflects on how the Portuguese dictatorship, so from 1926 to 1974, tried to evoke its social and moral values through the design of ideal home interiors by appropriating national archetypes. So over to you, Kylos, thank you. Thank you, and thank you for having me here. Um, I will I will read my my text for me not to say a lot of mistakes. So, a bem da nação, or for the good of the nation, was an expression used mainly in official correspondence to end a letter during the period of the right wing authoritarian Portuguese regime, self styled Estado Novo, New State which prevailed from 1926 to 1974. Its meaning it was obvious, acknowledging the missive's writer as an obedient citizen of the dictatorship and all its actions done for the nation's aggrandizement. In this brief essay, I will explain how the popular arts or folklore in general were appropriated by the regime to form aesthetic ideals that supported the creation of this state that wanted to be perceived as new. The search for the new would palingenetically happen while respecting profound reactionary nationalistic principles and rejecting the international modernity that came unbridled through the, through, through the borders, symbol of an antagonist, antagonistic progressive society already predicting itself to be global. Next slide, please. The appreciation of local folklore folklore went, ag went against the cosmopolitan, cosmopolitan Eurocentric attitude that prevailed in Portuguese culture and tastes until the end of the 19th century. Only the wake of nationalistic dispositions throughout Europe would pro proudly promote, also in Portugal, the development of an academic interest in eth ethnographic studies. These studies began with the study of adages, sayings, popular poetry, rituals, and traditions, but by the turn of the century, they were already researching possible traces of a domestic architecture and the production of handcraft objects by the peasants. But more interesting is the attention that some modern artists dev devoted to this production during the first decades of the century, like the Delaunay couple, that were refugees in Portugal from the horrors of the First World War and their Portuguese colleagues. For them, this production was as pure in its primitive, primitivist condition as that resulting from the so-called uncivilized societies that equally captivated them in their attempt to escape the European homogeneity of academism. Also, contemporarily produced in shabby workshops by illiterate artisans, these objects were nonetheless seen as being part of the long durée. Next slide, please. It was from this encounter with the vanguards that in significant part, this handcraft production began to permeate cosmopolitan urban environments in the following decades. Praised as modern objet d'art in a mainstream press articles, they surfaced from the impoverished rural world becoming increasingly popular. Through modernistic appropriations, characters, forms, and motives appeared in different outputs, such as costumes and sets for review theater designed by these younger and raptured modernist artists. What was considered the production of an ignorant art years before was now applauded. The dictatorship developed from the coup d'etat of 20 May of 1926 will turn this approach to the vernacular world into a political tool. As usual, in similar circumstances, the regime would base its social and moral values on conservative and nationalistic principles, resisting the international modernity while at the same time, sorry, 
being mindful of the references to its, its, to its historical past. Some of them, some of these images of the historical past, illustrations of the national decadence from which the dictatorship wanted to distance itself. The appropriation of popular arts was thus essential to developing an official cultural identity that, through the praise of this naive plurality, would serve as a moral cornerstone for the resurgence of the nation. For the success of this undertaking, the appointment of Antonio Ferro as director of the Secretariat of National Propaganda, uh, I will call it SPN, created in 1933, would be of significant value. Ferro was a journalist, critic, poet, and playwright closely associated since his youth with the Portuguese and international circles of futurism and modernism. His flamboyant persona, journalistic career, and political passions has, have created, had in as in many at those times, a deep attraction for authoritarian authoritarianism. In his articles, reviews, and editorials, he called for a change in society already late in a lethargic Portugal. Months before his appointment to the direction of the SPN, he had formulated the foundations of a cultural program entitled Policy of the Spirit, which advocated art and culture as the bedrock for creating a robust modern state. Next slide, please. At the helm of the official organism responsible for propaganda, he would set in motion this plan. Combining the celebratory nationalistic spirit of the regime with the desire to create a new nation, working the country's ethnographic sources, that were the repository of the dormant soul of these mythical people, through the modernist methods of synthesis was the most appropriate solution. However, a better recognition of these sources was essential as a foundation for this work. For this work. Therefore, based on the studies carried out until then and with the support of a, of a new generation of ethnographers equally committed to a passionate vision of the artistic production of the people, far removed from deeper sociological analysis, a compilation of objects was initiated that would form the SPN ethnographic collection. This collection was presented for the first time in 1935 in Geneva during a series of events held during the League of Nations meeting and the following year in Lisbon. From that date onwards, this expanding collection was regularly presented both within the country and internationally, as for example, during the international exhibitions in Paris and New York, where it would have a preeminent place as a way of presenting a country proud of its own roots. From 1948, it will be permanently displayed in Lisbon's recently inaugurated Popular Art Museum purposefully created for that reason. But the aim shouldn't be only to display these authentic artifacts. The true intention is recognized by Ferro's speeches either during Lisbon exhibition inauguration in 1935 or many years later at the Museum of Popular Art opening when this objective had already been initiated. And now I'm quoting Antonio Ferro's speech of 1935. The valorization of the people's art, of that art that can be considered the spontaneous, harmonious language of their hands, art of our people, an image of their simplicity and beauty, to exalt and sing the Portuguese people, the people of our towns, villages, hamlets, of our plains and highlands. But what is the use of this exposition? Its main utility is undoubtedly in the important contribution it makes to the resurgence of the national soul. It is also convenient to underline the pretext offered to our artists to enrich their vision and increasingly nationalize their art. It may also direct many of our artists towards the vast and rich field of the minor arts by creating workshops where they will develop the, clean, the clear and pure suggestion that the people is giving them, or simply by working to return small and taste, tasteful popular industries to their primitive good taste. Later, in 1948, he would still reiterate, in any case, this museum will remain here as a source of inspiration for our artists, as an ethnographic study center, the flower and root of our grace. What is more, 
the Museum of Popular Art will remain as a school of good taste to get ideas and suggestions for home decoration. Of the rich, who would come to get inspiration for their Portuguese furniture and interiors, and for the poor, who, by simply copying what they see, will not need to be rich to live beautifully. End of quotations. To accomplish this, and uh, next slide, please. To accomplish this, Ferro had called his modernist colleagues to collaborate with the Secretariat, thus consequently happy to see their work recognized and obviously paid by the state. Until the end of the 1940s, when Ferro would uh, retire from the direction of the SPN, they would help develop what Ferro would call the SPN style. This trendy rustic style, oxymoronically contemporary, despite being respectfully vernacular, appropriated the former formal features of the folk arts to outputs that acknowledged the necessities of the modern life, successfully creating this ideal image of a renewed Portugal. In reality, truth be told, a large part of this new, between commas, national identity endure until almost today, decades, decades after the end of the dictatorship, as the false memory of a primeval Portuguese material culture. Thank you. Thank you so much, Carlos. That was very interesting. Um, so if you've got any comments or questions, just leave them in the chat box and we'll get to them at the very end, like I've said before. So our final speaker for today is Joseph McBrenn, Dr. Joseph McBrenn, and he was educated and has worked in Ireland, Scotland and France. He holds an MA in, his, in Art History from the University of Glasgow and a PhD in Art History from the National College of Art and Design in Dublin. He has taught in the art schools in Dublin and Belfast since 2000. He is an Irish art historian and he also writes about a broad range of art, craft and design. Recently, he has published on the intersecting histories of gender, sexuality and disability in modern art, craft and design in several journals, for example, textile, cloth and culture, the journal of design history or the journal of modern Sorry. Um, craft. He has also written extensively on the craft workshops associated with the First and Second World Wars, as well as the craft produced during the Northern Irish Troubles, which happened in 1969 until 1998. His most recent publication is the monograph Queering the Subversive Stitch, Men and the Culture of Needlework, published in 2021. So over to you, Joseph. Thank you. Um, thank you, Victoria. Um, I'm going to turn my camera off, if that's okay. Um, just my broadband's not great. Okay, well, it's a pleasure to be here today. Um, I'd like to thank the organizers um, um, for accepting my, my paper. Um, so I'm going to talk about the Irish literary revival. And I'm going to look at um, visual and material manifestations of folk um, identity within that. So to begin, I really want to look, I want to begin with... Uh, uh, sort of a discussion of the idea of, of um, folk in relation to nation and most scholarship on th th this relationship of the visual and material uh, manifestations in, in the modern period of folk culture in, in relation to national revivalism have come from the work of historians, anthropologists and social scientists who work on nations, nationalism and national uh, um, identity. Benedict Anderson, in his book, Imagined Communities, Reflections on the Origin and Spread um, of Nationalism, has argued that nations, nationality and nationalism have all proved notoriously difficult to define, let alone analyse, in contrast to the immense influence that nationalism has exerted on the modern world, um, plausible theory um, to analyse it and its manifestations is conspicuously meagre. Anthony Smith, in an essay entitled History and Modernity, has reflected that the phenomena, a phenomena as complex as nation and nationalism and, and therefore folk culture may be examined from many angles, from their ubiquity in modern society and their scope and their salience, their social and cultural background, their political influence and geographical impact, and their significance and, and um, social theory. Ernest Gellner, in his book, Nations and Nationalism, has argued that there is an indisputable link between nationalism and uh, modernity. But what about 
nations like like Ireland, um, who were little industrialized from the 18th through to the 19th uh, centuries. And they remained in the early 20th century largely agricultural um, and largely rural. Anderson and Gellner have suggested that the use of concepts such as folk cultures to define such nations are um, analogous to concepts and um, the concepts of imagined communities and constructed nationhoods in which visual and material remnants of the past play a critical uh, role. For Eric Hobsbawm, nations, of course, uh, nationality and nationalism were also built upon the idea of, of completely invented uh, or invented or inventing traditions, which promoted were promoted by elite groups to counter um, disruption from capital industrialization, urbanization, mass and mass democratization. So the um, um, the development of an interest in a visual and material culture um, um, in Ireland that was specific to it um, and its past comes at a, um, at a moment of rupture in the early 20th century when Ireland seeks to assert itself um, independently from a colonial um, context within the British um, Empire. Um, so in Ireland, it was W.B. Yeats um, who would be central in a group of elite literary theorists who would articulate this idea um, of folk culture as being a central building block of what nationhood would become. Uh, the founding of the Irish nation, of course, took place in the 1920s. But from the 1890s through the early 1900s, Yeats and an elite group of, of, of literary figures um, um, sought to reinvent Irish identity, firstly through the um, research into the Irish language, but then um, um, slowly through um, archaeological um, and antiquarian research. Key figures, aside from Yeats, were Douglas Hyde, who's um, a, literary, uh, um, a literary figure um, who translated ancient Irish um, um, uh, stories into English for the first time. Um, working um, um, on his family's estate. Uh, Yeats was not from a, a land and aristocratic family, but most of the, the, the literary revivalists were. Hyde wrote under the name, he wrote under the um, the Irish name and Queeving Eving, which translates into English as the Little Branch. Um, and Lady Gregory was the other figure um, who Yeats was central um, in, in, in promoting folk culture with. Um, um, and it was Lady Gregory. Gregory that Yeats would find the Irish literary theatre with um, just before 1900. So W.B. Yeats argued that folk culture was a form of tradition in danger of being lost. He said, it's a type of supreme art, um, which is a traditional statement of a certain heroic and religious truth, passed on from age to age, modified by individual genius, but never abandoned. The revolt of individualism came because the tradition had become degraded, or rather because a spurious copy had been accepted in its stead. Folk culture, um, Yeats argued, with his friend, his collaborator, the writer George Russell, was a source of dreams which were long um, hoarded. Um, however, the literary the literary revivalists focused largely on communal experience, and although they began to um, to understand the, the significance of the visual and the material. Um, it was largely a linguistic experiment as it is understood today. Um, and it left little room for um, debate about, about how folk culture could re be reused um, to reimagine everyday life in an Irish context. Um, the most telling, um, one of the most telling kind of sources of study for folk revivalism in a European context is Miroslav Rock's book, The Social Preconditions of the National Revival in Europe, which states that the nation is of that question, one of the most fascinating phenomena, phenomena in modern um, political thinking. Um, and he suggests there is no modern nation without national consciousness in which he argues that the subjective and objective components of national consciousness are key to understanding each country's unique development. Nationalism is thus shaped by general factors, he says, these objective relations on the one hand, but on the other, the subjective conditions of an individual's own existence. Um, so this um, has led me to kind of think about the idea of the individual um, and the key individuals who really sought to reimagine folk culture within um, um, the Irish literary uh, um, revival, um, who reignited this interest in the everyday, were women who, to an extent, felt alienated, felt marginalised, felt extraneous to a lot of developments. Um, 
And it was a curious figure, this, this figure of Beatrice Elvery. We can see an image um, by Beatrice Elvery, which was produced um, um, for the, the Kula Press, which was a printing uh, press founded by W.B. Yeats' sisters, um, Elizabeth and Susan, just after 1900. Uh, and Beatrice Elvery um, was a prodig prodigiously talent talented student at uh, Dublin's Metropolitan School of Art. Um, where she um, um, joined the school aged just 13. From then on, she would work as a sculptor, as a painter, and as, as a vers versatile designer across a range of disciplines. And a little known today, she was actually more instrumental in, in generating in that time iconic images of the revival. Um, um, she was inspired directly by W.B. Yeats and Lady Gregory's play, Kathleen Houlihan, as well as the writings of Patrick Pierce, whose work she also illustrated. Um, if we could go to the next slide, please. Uh, here we are. So here are some examples of her work. She um, worked with two key features female writers of the revival, Violet Russell, who of course was a playwright and poet who was married to the writer George Russell um, and Catherine Purden. So you can see two illustrations um, on the left in the centre of her work uh, for them. She also worked for the, the Gaelic League, but she was particularly interested in these representations of women um, when um, she um, developed an interest in painting in the 1920s and 1930s she became particularly interested in the inner interior sexual life of women. And in 1931, she produced a quite a, a remarkable painting called The Intruder, which was shown in London at the Royal Academy. Um, and in that painting, that painting, we have a depiction of a, an Arcadian uh, landscape. It's almost like a ballet-like scene where we have um, a satire um, disturbing a group of uh, lovers. And this dream state that she paints is, is slightly like these dream states that she um, developed in the early 20th century, uh, you know, illustrating these, these texts by literary revivalists, but it goes much further into the interior subjective life of the individual woman at the time. The 1930s were a particularly um, difficult time for women in the, the new, newly formed independent Irish state, um, and women um, whose rights were being slowly eroded um, would be enshrined within the new constitution in 1937, the first major Irish constitution written since the 18th century. Um, they would be enshrined as, as um, uh, um, figures largely associated with domesticity and the home. And Beatrice, Beatrice Alvarez's uh, paintings of the 1930s are in some ways offering us a comment on that. She had a series of government commissions to, to produce murals um, for international exhibitions and so on, and they were cancelled. So early in the 1930s, she re um, um, she imagines her earlier work, these very dreamlike um, 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 images um, that she produced in the early 20th century for the literary revivalists, and we can see on the, the far right, a little stained glass panel, which was produced possibly um, as early as 1910, but she shows it in exhibitions in the early uh, uh, 1930s. Um, so can we go to the next slide, please? Sorry, could we go to the next slide? Thank you. Um, so here we have um, some of her work that she did for Inter Glina, which was one of the other um, sort of major workshops founded um, by the literary revivalists, uh, Dun Emer and Kula but was founded by, they were two workshops founded by the sisters of WB Yeats, Elizabeth and Susan, and Beatrice Elvery was a key, uh, key figure within them. These uh, stained glass windows were produced by Elvery um, at Interglina, another of these national workshops, which, which took uh, their names from Irish uh, um, folk history. Uh, uh, Dun Emer and Kula were terms which came from the Ulster cycle of mythology. Um, at, um, then Emer means Emer's fort. Emer, of course, was the um, um, the female equivalent of Hugh Helen in that in that mythological cycle. So here we have Elvery um, at Antirglina. Um, Antirglina is an Irish um, term which means the Tower of Glass. It was a stained glass cooperative set up by the painter Sarah Purser in 1903, um, and she later recalled. Um, that she didn't ever later recall, she didn't really like making stained glass, but she was quite superb at it. And here we have a tiny, a tiny church in the very west of Ireland, an island called Tory Island, and an extreme part of Ireland on the Atlantic coast. And here we have a window made by um, Elvery in 1910. 
um, Adam Turklin is showing the 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 traveller saint is our saint Saint Brandon who featured heavily in in um, Irish literary um, um, revivalist literature. Um, so we can see detail of the whole window, and we can see um, um, a detail. Um, so Elvery um, was part of a generation of of women who um, felt um, prescribed by what was happening in the 1930s. Um, if we could go to the next slide. Um, here we can see Nellie O'Brien's um, um, capturing of a series of murals painted by Saad uh, Natrinsuk at, a, um, at an, Irish, uh, an Irish language school on the west coast of Ireland. So Nellie O'Brien was an Irish artist um, of the same generation as Beatrice Silvery, the same context, um, and worked in a similar way. Um, but the change um, 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 that comes through um, the period is many of these women start to go back and look more closely at antiquity and certainly um, med the medieval remnants of, of Irish buildings, of Irish monastic sites, um, and particularly whatever is authentically able to be labelled Irish rather than the early literary rivalists, which there was a slight imagining uh, or reimagining you know, of, of a kind of uh, what was possible. So these murals by Saif Matrinsic, um, Saif Matrinsic was the daughter of the um, uh, Archbishop of Dublin, the Anglican Archbishop of Dublin, and Nelly O'Brien was a Gaelic leaguer. Um, they show these um, um, sort of wistful, um, um, dreamlike um, images of, of um, ordinary people and ordinary life on the west coast of Ireland in an Irish language speaking community. The west of Ireland was completely unindustrialized and certainly without electric power, we know, until you know, the mid to the late 20th century. Um, and if you go to the next slide, because I think I'm coming up um, over time. Um, uh, the final um, and most significant figure really to um, contribute to this movement was the artist Evie Home, who trained in Europe in, in the 1920s as an abstract painter and is associated with, uh, with the second kind of wave of Cubism in France and was a pioneer of abstraction. But um, under the, the, the context of working in Ireland, she became very interested in Celtic and medieval sculpture and in the 1930s um, embarked upon an attempt to kind of record um, and um, document as much of the surviving remnants um, of ancient and medieval um, um, sculpture and to reimagine those as as fused through this lens of, of Cuba's design um, format um, and, and style. Um, Hone produced, um, of course, stained glass windows, which she's most famous for, but also textiles and book illustrations. And in the 1940s, this was bought by um, the artist John Piper um, and illustrated in his wife's um, magazine, Pavilion, um, which was, yes, edited by Nathaniel Piper's, uh, Nathaniel Piper. So I think I'll stop there because I've gone right over time.